Right, I think we have got enough folk to start. Um, as I said in the introduction, uh, this plan, this session will provide definitive answers to a number of questions about a brighter future. And I can see the panelists shaking their heads already. Um, we have got a distinguished panel, and I'll, and I'll let them introduce themselves in a second. Um, the format is really, given the theme of the conference, Brighter Future, what we're going to ask folk to do is comment on what, what are the reasons to be optimistic and what, why, what have we learned from this last year and what can we, can we take forward, particularly after that really inspiring keynote from the, from the student speakers this morning. So it's what have we learned, what could we take forward? And we thought there were a number of areas where we might want to explore that, things like curriculum design, course design, learning and teaching strategies, assessment, um, assessment feedback, learning technologies, staff and student support, and then perhaps a bit of future gazing at the end. So that's the kind of range of areas that we want to, to cover. Um, what we would urge everyone to do is use the chat box, both for comments and questions as we go along. And I will keep monitoring the chat box and uh, interrupt the speakers and perhaps bring folk and bring folk in, depending on how many folk we end up with. Um, so we can give them a good interrogation uh, and see what comes see what comes out of it all. So in terms of kicking off, um, what have we learned about course design? What have we learned about curriculum design from the last year? Um, I'll do this alphabetically. So David Baum, introduce yourself and tell us what we've learned about curriculum design from this last year. Hi, I'm David Baum. I've been doing academic development for several decades now and may know one or possibly even two things about it. What I've learned above all is that contrary to rumor, change is possible. Um, you spend a lot of time in academic development trying to make anything move and suddenly an outside force swings in, a horrible one like this. And it turns out that, oh, you can change assessment. Oh, you can change course design. Oh, you can change the way we operate. So the terrific news is I have learned that change is possible. And next time, please God, let it not need a pandemic to make it possible. But what I've also learned is that instant rapid massive change isn't automatically a good thing. Um, there's a cynical definition of learning technology as um, doing the wrong things better. And some of what's happened in the pandemic is that we've done the wrong things better. We've, we've, we've taken teaching online when the real thing that was needed was a, a rethink of what learning and teaching actually are. So it's good news and bad news, but I'm gonna hang on to the good news. The good news is we have learned that change can happen and I hope whatever else happens as we move on that piece of learning will remain alive I think it's up to us developers and those optimistic teachers to keep that lesson alive we can change faster and bigger than we ever thought we could okay uh, Sue Beckingham say hello and introduce yourself and comment on that Sheffield Hallam University and I lead uh, teaching and learning in the Department of Computing. Um, what have I learned? I've learned that yes, um, change can happen as David David said, but also change can be flexible. Um, I've found that it's been really useful um, engaging my students in the way that I've adapted my teaching online and had those conversations. I've, I've experimented and tried new approaches and said, you know, is this working well? Is it not working well? Asked them for suggestions. So that flexibility of the way you uh, interact with your students, get them engaged in activities um, has been experimental, but actually really enjoyable. And, and, and together we've, you know, sort of created something that works for, for all of us. Okay, Katrina, uh, introduce yourself and say what, what, what's come out for you on course design and curriculum design over the last year. 
Hi everyone, I'm Katrina Cunningham from the University of Stirling up in Scotland and here to offer a kind of Scottish perspective perhaps on how that's maybe differed to what's happened elsewhere in the UK. So um, I would say for me the biggest change has been, apart from what's been mentioned so far, is the way in which we're almost questioning who owns the curriculum, who shapes the curriculum, whose voices are absent from the curriculum, whose voices need to start becoming visible in the curriculum. And I think that um, is one of the, again, the most important and exciting changes that's happened from the pandemic. Uh, Mary, Mary Fitzpatrick, please introduce yourself and answer the question. What have you got out of the last year in terms of course design and curriculum design. Thanks very much Peter and uh, lovely to be here. Um, just Mary Fitzpatrick from the um, Centre for Transformative Learning in the University of Limerick and like Katrina I'm here to bring an alternative perspective from the Irish shores as to um, how we've, we've um, managed this. Certainly to add to what our colleagues have said, you know, the, the flexibility of the curriculum has been increasingly um, visible, but also um, to further develop what Katrina mentioned around who owns the curriculum and the role of the, the student voice within that curriculum in the design of the curriculum, but also how it can be adaptable. Again, um, talking to where Sue is coming from. So there's, there's a huge amount of learning, and I think we heard a huge amount from the students this morning, which fits in very well with our experience of the curriculum. Okay, thanks. Um, one question from now on, I'll, I'll, I'll start throwing questions out to all the panel. Uh, so just wave if you want to respond. One of, the, one of the things that came out to me from the student keynotes this morning was a potential difference between the English, possibly the Welsh experience as well, the Scottish and the Irish experience. Have you picked up on anything that's perhaps specific to your area, your context? Katrina? Yeah, I think a big difference uh, in Scotland is that so far, Scottish students don't pay fees. So I think mm. a lot of the, the tension and debate that's been happening south of the border where you have students, you know, there's been a lot of focus on a sense of value for money. And on the one mm. hand, that raises a really important issue around well, what is the purpose of higher education and, and, you know, the whole kind of neoliberal cr critique of students as customers and all of that. But I think... It has raised interesting questions about, yeah, the purpose of higher education. So I think that's that and we've not certainly at Sterling, we've not had that sense from students in the same way. I don't know if anyone would, would agree or disagree or have a different perspective. Mary, is there an Irish perspective? I think you'd see through the through the programme and um, following on from Katrina's point, that partnership approach has been very clear. A lot of the discussions at national level due to a number of national projects that have been running, have been led by the students. So a lot of the supports for the students have been designed and provided by student associates and student interns, which has been hugely beneficial. And I think has opened up the um, forum for the students to be very much partners in higher education and having their, their say and their, their say in a meaningful way, um, which maybe might have been the case previously. We in terms of going on to more specifics about learning and teaching, anything that you really want to think that we have learned that we should take forward, we must not lose. I'd say that we've learned to uh, appreciate Sue, Sue our learning first, technologies. Yeah. yeah, say that again, sorry. I'd say that we've learned to appreciate our learning technologists and the various different <laughs> names that they've been given, which, um, you know, I'm not saying that they weren't appreciated before, but, um, you know, they've done a remarkable job. Uh, and, you know, some of us have part that role and part educational developers, but, you know, they, they really have been incredible and so patient to, you know, have had the volume of staff to deal with the thing, you know, over, over this time, but also, you know, building that relationship with them so that we can develop the curriculum further and activities, whether that's, you know, the, the teaching um, or, or the assessment. It's, it's been, been great to um, build that partnership and, um, you know, have deeper conversations. David? I've learned that the most important, the, the most valuable single thing we could do would be to clone Neve and Dylan and provide one copy of them in every 
UK and indeed global higher education institution. I suspect we don't need to do that because I think there are Neves and Dillons pretty much around the place. But good heavens, we've got to find them and we've got to get them listened to because they were awesome. They really were. They just know because they've been through the experience, they've thought about it. And one thing which we've kind of learned, but I'm not sure we know how to implement yet. I think we've learned things about the importance of flexibility, adaptability, and so on. But most of our work at the moment is on distance learning programs with um, mainly with the University of London international programs. Um, and this is the point at which my optimistic remarks about the change begin to seize up a bit. Distance learning, as currently practiced, does carry a lot of baggage with it, does carry a lot of rigidity with it. There is a course locked in, I mean, sorry, Sue, but to some extent locked into the technologies. Uh, it's getting easier to change distance learning courses rapidly, but it's still, I believe, too difficult to do that. So I think we need to, we need to find ways of making distance learning as adapt, more adaptable, more readily, rapidly changed. I don't mean it hasn't changed, it's changed quite a bit, but there can be a sense of fixity there, which we need to deal with because the world's changed shape on us and um, the, the, the learning media need to as well. So I think there's a particular challenge here for distance learning and I'll stop there. I'm just observing the chat box, a couple of quotes there from, from Sandy Cope about the speed of change. Sandy, do you want to come in and join us and say a few words on that? You can refuse this invitation if you wish. Um, getting a response now. There you go. You are, you are. I couldn't find my buttons. <laughs> okay. My mouse was playing up. I just think, because um, I work, like everybody, I guess I work really closely with this and our sort of four year plan um, or the, the, the pace that we wanted to get to as an institution has, has just seen a, a huge, as you would expect, you know, sort of we were laughing about it the other day, four years to four months type scenario, um, which has been an incredible achievement by that team because we were giving them temp temporarily, we were just giving them every spare body that we could at the beginning, you know, every other team was just like, have these for, you know, um, in some terms of some of the mechanics. And I think they they feel that they've got a really good methodology now in terms of supporting people, which they're going to use as a platform. But also one of the things that we've realized is, Yes, lots of money was just thrown at this team in the short term and at the beginning, but we can really, really capitalise on that. And um, it's made such a strong case for the investment, which, you know, we all know that it needs investment in this area if you're going to do it well, rather than tinker at it. Um, but I think for them, it's just a, a godsend in terms of the investment that's really been appreciated now across the institution. Yeah, yeah. You'd, uh, Katrina's made a comment in the chat box about the word distance having its own implications. Do you want to expand on that? Yeah, I think words like distance and remote are the very opposite of the kind of community and collaboration that we're trying to achieve. And so mm. um, we've been trying to avoid those that language just to, to you know, even imply that or have it there. Um, but one thing I wanted to kind of come in on just on the conversation there is the almost the visibility that the last year has, I think it's show so, so for once um, teaching which often takes place in quite a private intimate space has been made very visible through the videos that teachers are making and the kind of ways that staff have been collaborating with one another to co-create resources with students that they're exposing their own vulnerability to students by kind of acknowledging that we were all learning together mm. and I think that's been really interesting because people have actually seen that teaching is hard work and teaching online is hard work and engaging students is hard work. And certainly um, our students at Sterling, and I know this was the, the case in a lot of the media as well, students complaining that they had too much work 
online so they felt they had more work than when they were in the traditional setting and that is fascinating I think. Mm. There was uh, in, a, in a previous session this morning that uh, David Baumer and I were at uh, Alastair Irons was talking about him coming in as a computer science coming into education from industry thinking he might have a bit of a rest and, might, and in fact never working as hard as he has done in his life so I think that notion that teaching people don't appreciate just with the, the kind of effort that goes in and of course we now have zoom fatigue as well to, to add on to the list um I did have a rather unfortunate conversation with a learning technologist the other day who said that he'd just been congratulated by his VC um, as if, well, you've done your job now, thanks very much. We can now get back to normal. I just wonder whether that, there might be just a, a sense in which, oh yes, these techie folk have done a really great job. Um, so, so how can we stop that kind of reversion back to the old ways? Anybody want to chip in on that? If the feeling is that the techies, I'm using the language you quoted, not my language, I have the highest sure. respect for learning yeah. technologies, but um, I'm not going to call them techies anymore, that's rude. If we, if we notice what they've actually done, what they have actually done substantially, they make communications like this work, which is a, a powerful, important achievement. But to repeat my earlier point, they have also put a lot of work into putting lectures online or and I will repeat the phrase, maybe doing the wrong things better in a different medium. I think my, my concern is that we haven't gone to, we haven't gone from the old fashioned face-to-face -face ways of working to the newfangled online ways of working. We've gone mostly to a newfangled online version of the old ways of working. I think we've done the first thing, which is to make some kind of education possible. I'm really concerned that we haven't gone right back to the basics and dragged the attention across from teaching through new media to learning and its support. That's a much bigger, a much deeper quest. And in a sense, the sheer panic rush has actually made that quest harder because as the VC said, implied, you've done it now. That's a disastrous message. We have not yeah. done it now. Yeah. We've implemented the old methods in a new medium. And we all we have left to do now is reinvent education. But the fact that change has been proved to be possible is a good indicator there. Because when I talk about learning rather than teaching, I get funny looks, but I always get funny looks. But people are starting to nod a bit now. And one or two people have actually said, could you say a bit more about that? And mm -hmm. I've obviously been delighted to do so. Um, but we've got to keep going on this one now. The message, the transition has happened and the new normal has arrived and everything's fine, is a catastrophic message, which we must not let out. Sue, did you want to intervene and then Mary? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the... the the vulnerability that we're, we've experienced on online you know what, what I've, I've particularly learned is that because we've asked our students you know that 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 awkward moment you know when you've got to share your screen and you've not unmuted and all those things and you think oh gosh this is not very polished and I'm so unprofessional and yet as, as I continued to develop my teaching and sort of got the students to share their screen and I'd have to take them through the steps to show them how to do that because we've not been used to using whether it's um, Blackboard Collaborate or, or Zoom as, as help them see that, you know, these things don't always happen as slickly as, as you might imagine. So that, that empathy and, and learning together to use the different technologies in these spaces has, has been, you know, important as well. Mary? Thanks, Peter. Yeah, I think um, in light of what, what's been said, the idea that it was pedagogy first. I mean, the learning technologists did an incredible job in moving something. And I think somebody had it in the chat there um, that might have taken four years otherwise or longer overnight. And suddenly we had something online and the emergency move to, and I won't use that dreaded um, pivot word, but that emergency transition to the online space in comparison to how people adapted to it, both the staff and the students was incredible. 
And it just shows that the flexibility that's there, but also the point that um, Shelley's making in the chat there as well. It's, you know, it's not just moving your, your teaching into the online space. It's actually reimagining what, what can be done with the technology that's there. So pedagogy comes first, not just how it fits into the technology that's available. And I think that was something that we all learned as well. Mm. Like to, to pick up a couple of things that have cropped up in the chat. Sue, your comment at my university, we call online the extended campus. How important is that language, do you think? I think it's very important because, you know, the, the students that sign up for a online course, you know, such as the Open University, they kind of buy into whatever it is that um, is, is on offer there, whereas, you know, our students that Aren't, aren't in that situation you know they, they 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 want to have the the campus experience but then through this last year they've also found that the the move to perhaps having bite-sized lectures and um alternative ways of of capturing learning that can be recorded that can be re revisited played back in their own time you know that can help them with revision you know i think it's opened their eyes to a variety of um of different ways that we can present learning and teaching. Um, you know, my hope is that this will continue as we go back to partially face-to-face, -face, maybe not all face-to-face, -face, that, you know, we can still continue to have what, you know, I describe as some of these things as um, active learning, you know, mm. and having a, a more flexible classroom approach, um, which is something actually I, I, I shifted to quite a few years ago now from separating the lecture in a seminar situation to having workshops so doing a bit of talking then interactive having students with laptops we've got laptops in a, a cabinet that they can bring out so you know it, it, it's an opportunity for different approaches to continue and, and continue to learn from new new ideas okay yes indeed uh, a couple of things that have cropped up in the uh, in the chat box um sandy you mentioned that your session is going to be talking about issues like that this afternoon do you want to give you give a quick plug for that session but i warn you that you can only have 30 seconds because you're in competition with me so do you want to give us a, a quick, a quick oh, oh, introduction actually, to your session okay we, we've actually been thinking about what good practice has happened that we want to keep and what has just sort of like David has said, has just been an emergency, get something up there that we really don't want to keep. But I think we feel that, well, I, I think we've, you know, we've got to make a conscious effort not to let some of the good things that we've actually had, that have emerged out of this come back. It's no use, I think, just uh, expecting it to carry on. People will slip back into old habits over time if we actually don't make it explicit. And deliberately, I think, uh, keep those strategies going. Yeah. Uh, also a comment there from Claire, Power Claire Power, about the, the shout out for academic staff developers, education developers. Do you want to, to chip in there, please, Claire? Okay, um, sorry, just get my camera on if I can. But yeah, it's essentially it was about, um, <laughs> We were very much in the situation last spring of having to get up to speed very quickly with totally unfamiliar tools um, with, you know, some technological knowledge, etc. But, you know, I would no means by say that I was the sharpest pencil in the pencil case as far as, um, you know, adapting to new technology. Um, yet having to sort of front up pretty much overnight with our groups of new lecturers um, to be the calming influence and um, you know yes this is all all right guys we can use this tool and it'll work and <laughs> etc so I just wanted to make that point because I think again um, tell, yeah tell teams quite rightly have been celebrated and they ha they have been um, recognized for, for everything they've done but I definitely I I feel in my institution, um, the academic de developers have been overlooked, and I th I'm sure that that's the situation in many other institutions as well. Yeah, indeed. There, there, David Baum has just asked a question about uh, 
a comment following a comment from Richard about putting lectures online. And I know that that debate has been happening over the last two or three weeks. There's been uh, a couple of things in THE about uh, you know, the role of the lecture. And that just seems to be a, a debate that we've been having for decades, if not centuries. Um, uh, Richard, do you, uh, do you want to chip in and just tell us a bit about that and perhaps respond to David's question? Yeah, I can do. Um, at the time, uh, as University of Leeds, obviously the pandemic started, timetables were already in place, students were already expecting certain types of delivery and the content, they just needed to happen. So at that time, March 20, whatever it was, 20 then was it back then? Um, it was a matter of finding a solution, quick fix. And we had a lot of online delivery and development and we had a team where we were able to step in um, and support the staff just to get the stuff online, whether it was live lecture or material, um, mm. and just get it into a coherent system. The students then wouldn't miss out. So that was a big push in okay. an emergency. Then after that, it's very much taking a step back and thinking actually what works with that and what doesn't work and the pedagogy and getting that developed. And the staff were brilliant. I mean, they just took to it. Even the ones that never used a computer before couldn't even send an email. They were there from day one. Um, doing live lectures and we were there mm. supporting them but after that they've learned from that and they're going to try and embed that within it and um, my main concern though is them not taking a step back so we've talked about that already of going mm. back to the old norm because it's 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 a little bit about comfort and confidence the support was there during the emergency people had to do something they did it but then what can happen now is that what I call the rebound effect is that they'll go back mm. to the old ways because they're comfortable with that if they're challenged or if they've got pressure teaching a lecture is dead easy trying to mm. think of a new way of doing that and utilizing the stuff needs a bit of confidence building and helping the academics see their identity in that and who they can be they can mm. then flush and help the students find their, their identity and be co-creators co etc yeah and have you have, just, to, just to keep you on the spot for a minute richard yeah have yeah. you got any have you got any strategies do you think for helping lecturers make that kind of transition into a bit of a new norm Anything working for you? Yeah, I think what it is for me, um, I mean, this is uh, the background of this was my doctorate. So I did a lot of work on teacher identity in different spaces, physical and online. So loads of stuff mm. there. But what came out of it, the key thing really is um, the, the teaching staff, the academics want to feel safe in an environment they understand. So talking them through that, visualizing it in some way where they see the different spaces and the opportunities and allowing them to pick the, what they feel is the best for them or what is it a comfortable challenge for them and obviously working trying to get the learners involved as well and getting them feeling comfortable with the learners as co-creators or co-explorers in that space mm -hmm. uh, that really works um, and the, the big the bottom line is don't put them under pressure take away the other pressures the stuff like uh, meeting targets meeting um, performance indicators whatever it might be take that away for a little while while everybody mm -hmm. then re-establishes what's going on whether that'll happen or not is not is way out of my pay grid, but it may happen. Well, we, we wish you good fortune on that, definitely. Uh, a couple of thoughts yeah. that follow on from that. Katrina, you were talking about the the cost to staff uh, that's come out of this. Do you want to follow that through, please? Yeah, I mean, that's not very, it's not, not really in keeping with the optimistic in the title of the session, yeah. but I think what we're seeing, and, and again, I know this is across the sector, is after 18 months or 15 months or whatever of this kind of um, focus on teaching and the adaptation and the pressures that staff have been under, we are seeing, yeah, the, the burnout. And, and because, as you, you were just referring to, um, is it Richard, yes. that staff the, the research pressures haven't gone away and nothing else has gone away but this is just piling on and on and on and on and I think there is um, real anxiety about what happens in the autumn because it is so uncertain and we can't offer that certainty because it's going to be a mixture of face-to-face -face and online and and so I think particularly as an educational developer there's I, I have a strong sense of um, responsibility and how do I how, how can I offer support at this time when, when yeah, it's so challenging? Yeah. So just raising more questions, not really offering answers. Mary, you look like you're coming in there. Yeah, I was going to say, say Mary, you mentioned that uh, LT forum. Maybe you could say a bit about that as well. 
I will, Peter, but I'll just respond to what Katrina's yeah, saying sure. there as well around the burnout, if I may. I think what's happened, and I think this is in, in kudos to everyone that's been teaching in this space over the last 15 months, what was completely abnormal has been normalized and we're still in a pandemic. And I think a lot of the, the points that Dylan and Eve mentioned earlier on around the pedagogy of care and empathy and, uh, you know, linking in with where people are coming from, some of those situations are still there. There's still the implications of the pandemic. And I think in some instances they may have been forgotten and it's just a case of planning the next, you know, the next academic year. So I think we need to remember that the, the context in which everybody's coming from is still uncertain and they're dealing with different fallouts that you know were unexpected. Um, in terms of the Learning Technology Forum, we're hugely um, grateful and appreciative of all the work that they've done. We, we were so lucky that we have a Learning Technology Forum, which is comprised of um, the learning technologists from across the campus, from across all of the different faculties and from our own centre, um, educational developers and um, librarians, people who are involved in curriculum design. And they all, we had a forum already arranged as a, or organised, established as a community of practice. Um, and that forum came into its own. I mean, within 24 hours of the move to remote learning, um, a schedule of supports was already available for the following week. And they have continued to provide absolutely critical support in the division, in, in devising resources, but also in provision of consults with people and um, panels um, that are organized online. And they've just done incredible work. And through their work, uh, they have magnified really what's what we need to value. And to the point where there is it's it's highly unlikely we're going to go back to the way it was because the Learning Technology Forum have shown us that there are so many alternatives, very much like what Richard has, has spoken about here earlier. And um, absolutely critical that we highlight what is working and what we can continue, but we're not moving to an open institution, either an open an open university. We still have, you know, the, the campus and everything, but it's it's looking at how we can use the learnings that we've had in a way that will benefit both the staff and the students. And in light of the points that Katrina is making about burnout, that we really need to look at how to manage that because there's a vulnerability now around returning to campus, um, which previously mm -hmm. we were all delighted to do, but now there's a vulnerability and, and a concern from both staff and students about how that might work and how they'll adapt again. So I think we're, we're I think, yeah, you're saying that there, Sue, if you want to come in on that, there's definitely support required there as well. Sue, do you want to comment in that? Yeah, I agree, you know, and, and it's, you know, I'm thinking about particularly the new staff that we've taken on board in the last last year, so they've never been into campus, you know, so actually to come into the classroom, you know, all the things that you kind of take for granted when you go into the classroom, you go up to the podium, how do you operate the controls, where's the volume, how do you make the screen come down? Yeah. Uh, you know, do you have to record your lectures? Is it automatic? I mean, there'll be a hundred <laughs> and one different different things that will, um, you know, so, so having an opportunity to have walkthroughs with with staff, I think will be be useful as well. And, and, and discussions about the activities, because, you know, the face to face, you know, we think back to using whiteboards, using flip chart paper, post-it notes, you know, is that something that we still shouldn't use because of, you know, the current current situation, as we said, has not, has not gone away. Um, you know, so there's there's lots to think about, really. But having the conversations and and unteasing the things that are on people's minds, I think, is going to be um, really important, and, and we'll support them. And you know, we might not have all the answers, but at least we can you know address it together. And Anne just made a nice comment in the chat box about all the staff who've forgotten how to work all this stuff because they've been away for so long. Absolutely. Um, I wonder if Katrina could bring you back in to respond to that comment from the David Baums highlighted where you yes, said... sorry, I was typing away furiously in the chat, but it's probably easier to talk. So right. it was just based on... A, we actually uh, co-created a module with our learning technologist last summer, and we got probably about 60 or 70% of our staff through this week-long module that was supporting mm. the transition to online teaching. And a lot of those staff were maybe mid-career, mid to late career academic mm. colleagues who had either never or rarely engaged with CPD and learning and teaching. And for a lot of them through the discussion board chats and the live webinars, I mean, the conversations were brilliant because it was kind of, for the first time they were thinking about teaching. And they weren't thinking in terms of, right, I'm going to come in and deliver this lecture. And, and so they were actually quite enthused and excited. And, and I think, I, I do think, saw themselves as teachers for the first time. And it's been interesting to see how they've had this renewed vigour 
this year for teaching I would say not all of them and obviously there is the burnout but it was it was a really positive moment I think mm -hmm. so what's the trend I think this is so interesting to me because I'm researching and writing about this at the moment so what's the transition from lecturer to teacher I think for, for them, because what we did was, I mean, it's a bit like Sue mentioned earlier about the active learning, it was actually trying to see their role um, as, as having a responsibility to engaging their students and not just transmitting or sort of chucking knowledge at them, but there was, they, they had to try and yeah, engage their students in their learning. So there was a lot of, you know, the, the sort of research about the videos, for example, that you couldn't make them too long because we know that people lose focus, can't concentrate after kind of six minutes. And this was really troubling for a lot of colleagues. It's kind of six minutes, but that's ridiculous. They should be able to focus for an hour and not spoon feeding. This is a nonsense. Da, 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 da. Yeah. But actually, when they started creating some of these materials and thinking about what what they're trying to do with that knowledge and so think about what teaching is was was so enlightening for them and for us that's an astonishing you've done something if i may say so you've done something really important there i hope to goodness you're going to write this up because this is really i'm perfectly serious now this is very important very substantial stuff i think the um, challenge is how that then continues into the future that's the challenge isn't it Mm. We just hope it's irreversible, don't we? Mm. I think that's a that's a real challenge that, that I've come across. I did a little bit of work for a university down south, helping them develop their course for, uh, you know, to, to manage this online. And one of the things that with another, working with another consultant as well, and one of the things we suggested, which worked very well for them, was getting their staff to talk about their examples. And again, it generated that sense of community dialogue um, uh, some, some similar experiences to Katrina there in terms of staff coming on board and, you know, and maybe, the, maybe one of the things that's happened is we've created um, dialogue or opportunities or a, a sense of having dialogue where dialogue did not exist before. You know, how, might, how many conversations about learning and teaching really went on in the cafe or the effect or casually? But maybe now they do. I don't know whether... Anybody wants to, to pick up on that? Can, actually, I, I just wanted to go back to a point that Mary made, if you don't yep. mind. Absolutely. Um, but um, my background was, I drifted into universities. I don't know whether most of us did, but I drifted into this career because I actually um, put businesses online very early. So my background was sort of marketing in commercially and putting businesses online. And I think we might see one of the phenomena that we used to see um, a while ago, actually, in sorts of behavior. And what happened about 15, 20 years ago in terms of behavior, and I'll use a, a commercial example, was that um, if, you were to, uh, if you were choosing a new supplier, for example, I don't know, let's say British Gas, or you wanted to move your, your utilities, um, there was a lot of behaviour at the time where the customers would would expect to see their bill online, but they wouldn't they wouldn't work in that way. They didn't transact in that way. But but their perception was that if it wasn't online, you weren't any good as a company. Okay, and I wonder whether we're going to see that with students and student behaviour that they expect some of these lectures and various learning activities online, but actually it will be quite a while until. It's actively used. Now, nobody, hardly anybody uses paper. They don't want paper bills from, you know, British Gas mm. or whatever. Mm. They've made that transition. But for a while, there was this messy in the middle where, and it was hugely expensive for companies where they wanted, where customers wanted the facility to be able to see the bill, but they still wanted the paper one. <laughs> because it was, and, and I've seen over, over this period of, you know, 15 years that that has changed and behaviour has changed. And I was talking about this with somebody internally the other day, and I do wonder whether we'll see that with student behaviour, that they'll want the, you know, the, the, they'll expect it to be online and it will form part of their choice, but they still want to come on campus. And that mm. will be difficult for, I think, for institutions to manage in the short term until that behaviour is fully changed in, in however it settles down. I don't know how it will settle down. I don't know, you know, but it was just, a, and that is a big burnout. <laughs> 
potentially is a big burnout area for staff. Um, but it, it was just a thought we were discussing the other day. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to leave you in five minutes. But, but I, so I just wanted to get that point in. Yeah, yeah. That 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 that, that whole kind of transition notion, I think, is, is going to be really interesting. Um, Katrina, did you want to chip in there? Not really, just to, to kind of absolutely confirm that. And I think that relates to the burnout is that staff now feel that students now want both. They want the online and they want the face to face and kind mm. of you know, how how can that work? And I think that's where having conversations between staff and students is really important. So mm. one of our students, not the one speaking this morning, but another one, because we've been trying to run some academic development events with staff and students a bit like this in a panel and kind of discussing things. And one of um, our students talked about this screaming into the, the chasm, which I thought was or, or the void. And I think that's how a lot of staff feel. But a lot of students were totally unaware. So, so where we can have those conversations and understand that this is a shared process. But I think that's probably much harder in the English context where there is this issue of fees. And, and it's kind of, I don't know, that makes it more challenging. Okay. Um, how about assessment? We haven't talked about assessment yet. Uh, and one of the interesting things about the uh, the student key keynotes this morning was how they don't want to go back to exams, and I don't don't blame them. Um, but we we really need to to use this opportunity to to bring assessment out of the out of the nineteenth century or wherever it is currently embedded. Um, how are we going to do that, and, what, and and how do you see staff of it's shaken up enormously. Um, my, my, the University of London distance learning programs had to take one hundred and ten thousand examinations online in the summer of twenty twenty, and they had to do it very rapidly indeed. And it was as big and challenging an operation as it sounds as if it would be with 110,000. But one or two patterns are emerging now. Um, there's been, there was the acknowledged shift from closed book to open book, um, simply because there was the shift from being assessed in examination rooms and examination centres to being examined on your kitchen table. Um, there was the rapidly growing realisation that open book in practice means open world just because you can't you can't manage what they have on the desks. Attempts have been made. This isn't just London at online proctoring and examining and watching people take their exams. And overall, it probably hasn't been a triumph, I don't think, because it was found to be intrusive and also not always very effective. So there's been an absolutely essential, massive change in examinations. I don't think we've worked out all the implications of it yet, but the change from three hour or one hour exams to 24 hour or a week long, not that they'll be examined for 24 hours or a week, but you've got 24 hours to get it in to avoid all the hideous technical problems that you get with submitting online exams. The changes to examinations assessment has been in many ways greater than the changes to teaching. You can't just replicate the three hour exam hall experience online. You just can't, that's all. Now, again, it's gonna take a year or two to think through the implications of this for authentic assessment, for improved course design, but th that's been massive. And it'd be intriguing to hear what experience other colleagues have had of online assessment, because we know assessment leads. Uh, James, an interesting question there in the chat box from James Wisdom. James, do you want to come and deliver it to the, to the community if you're there? Um, not especially. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think David, David was saying much what I was hinting at um, while the, the thing was rattling in. Mm. Um, I, I, I'm afraid I think an awful lot of vice chancellors think this job has been done. We rescued the institution during the crisis and we need to get back to the traditional models, you know, because we need the refectory income and all that stuff. Um, and we haven't yet made a case, academically made a case, 
for the assessment processes to be better than they were mm. when they were the traditional process into which notions of quality had been baked very hard. And I think that job still needs to be done. Okay, let me... I think uh, I would agree completely with that. Uh, Katrina? Yeah, I think what's interesting about assessment is how um, how useful it is to work not just as a higher education sector, but to work with our colleagues in secondary education. And I don't know if any of you here were at, there was a really interesting uh, webinar ran last week with the QE Scotland and a high school in Fife. And there was this idea of shared learning, but I think the fact that you've now got two years of, of sort of, well, our, our pupils from high school who are going to be coming into the university with no experience really of sitting traditional exams. So in a way how we can work with, yeah, teaching colleagues to rethink what we do, but there is deep resistance certainly from colleagues in universities not to return to exams, I feel, uh, particularly those that are accredited by um, professional bodies. So the professional bodies are saying you need to do these exams, otherwise we will not credit your programmes. And that's a challenge as well. So mm. it's kind of got to, we've got to get beyond the sector, I think, to solve that. Yeah. Well, I think there's a, there's a, two things that, that come out to me, one from the session this morning, really, that if students have really got a strong voice to say, you know, we do, we do these assessments that we have undertaken as a result of the, of the pandemic are better. Maybe that's, rather than just criticise the old order, maybe that's the, the, the argument that we need to make to say that things have, that the, this new way of doing things is actually better from all, for all sorts of reasons. And if, if CEDA makes that argument, if students make that argument, maybe that will start shifting, shifting the kind of, uh, shifting the balance. Uh, and we shall we'll see what that happens. Um, anybody else want to, to take that forward? I could do with hearing more from Richard on the approach he describes on the chat at the, in his 1216 message. I'd really love to know more about how to do assessment better in the ways he indicates. Is that possible? Uh, yeah, that's a bit precise. I'm typing a lot of things at once here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Tell us um, all about it. Okay, uh, well, I was just thinking about back to my time at FE because I spent a lot of time working in FE, which is very vocational based, but it's still got elements of HE in it because I crossed both paths. And we ended up spending a lot of time looking at assessment from problem-based, scenario-based point of view, but creating it in a way where it was individualised, either reflecting the work of the students or the work experience they were doing, somewhere where it was a lot more... Um, sort of geared towards that student's learning to be able to demonstrate that evidence that they've taken on the knowledge and skills rather than just test them because exams just don't work in an FE environment for several reasons we haven't got the space we never had the space and uh, we haven't got the facilities and the student body aren't really suited to that type of assessment or that's what they believed anyway and um, so that's what we spent a lot of time doing and what was interesting though from Katrina's point of view about the professional bodies is a lot of those were accredited courses with professional bodies and it just took a matter of negotiating with the, the accrediting bodies or the professional bodies to say well this is the assessment we're thinking of doing and having that negotiation and make sure it met the standards and they were quite flexible they were more flexible than you expect so when I came into HE and HE I say no we can't do this because the professional body says my flags go up straight away thinking, have you actually asked them? I mean, I know they will, and there are some that will, are very, very stubborn. But this situation has given us so much opportunity now where I think we could bounce back and say, no, sorry, mm. we're not doing an exam. That just doesn't work. Please tell us what else you would like us to do instead and encourage them and show them some examples. Mm. I, think that, that, I think that last point there, Richard, is a really important one, is that we now have examples that have worked because we've had to do it, that we can go back with them. And I also had some experience myself of folk who thought that this must be the case because the professional body had said so, but then nobody had actually asked the professional body for a period of years. And so they were in fact out of date. So yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of kind of communication negotiation that could go on perhaps over the next six months where we 
It is. I mean, the professional bodies at the end of the day, a lot of their standards are about demonstrating the, the knowledge as opposed to just knowing the knowledge. And it's, I think it's in their best interest going mm. forward to be able to do that in a much more proactive and demonstrable way. But as you say, they're very variable. Yeah. We often, we often enjoy constraints. Um, a long time ago, degrees in polytechnics in England were awarded by a national body called the, Pro the Council for National Academic Awards. And I was arguing for some change to assessment in engineering program. I was teaching on designing and colleagues said, oh, you couldn't possibly do that. The Council for National Academic Awards wouldn't let you. It had been abolished four years previously. Um, sometimes we want our prisons, you know. <laughs> right. OK, on that cheerful note, um, uh, just a, a thought, actually, is, uh, is Ruth still with us? Ruth Whitfield? I don't think she is. Ruth, are you there? No, I think you've yes. got to go. Yes, I'm are you there? Here. Yeah. Right. I was going to talk about, uh, <laughs> I was just going to mention there's a, there's a quote there from Mary talking about uh, programme level of assessment. And we have noted a uh, uh, an increased interest in programme assessment, and we're doing a workshop on that later this week, aren't we? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the, I think your experience was that that, that focus on programme actually helped some courses manage yeah, so, the online. So during move. the pandemic, and I don't think we were alone in this, but um, when we were looking at the assessments that still needed to be done rather than looking at an, an individual module we were actually looking at the program learning outcomes and trying to work out which of the program learning outcomes hadn't yet been met through assessment. And then we redesigned the assessments based on the outstanding program um, learning outcomes. And that was quite successful in, in some areas. And, in, and um, certainly in our optometry department, um, they use synoptic assessment. And actually the progression through to the second year was... Uh, much stronger than it has been in, in previous years. Unfortunately, I've learned since that, that, that I don't think they're carrying through with that when we move through to uh, on-campus uh, provision next year. So I shall be um, taking that up with them and having a conversation. But uh, yeah, people have, have demonstrated that there are benefits, um, but it's always that this is the new and we'll slip back into the old. Um, mm. And I think that's one of the big dangers and challenges that we've got at the moment. Mm. Uh, and you mentioned, you, do you have to raise a question earlier about staff support? Do you want to pitch in anything about that, about the importance of staff support? Well, in a sense, you've illustrated that with that last comment, haven't you, really? Yeah, I think, I think we're putting a lot of focus into thinking about the student situation, uh, which is exceptional this year. Um, but I think we need to make sure that we put focus also on to uh, supporting staff. Mm. Um, we've had quite a lot of new members of staff who've never gone onto campus, et cetera. But I think it's just also um, going back into the big out world, outside world is, is a challenge for all of us. Um, so I think it's just getting people to feel confident and back into their comfort zone. And I think there will be a lot of nervousness and anxiety um, mm. at the start of the next academic year. I mm. think also the, the actual burnout and the chance for people to be able to recover um, or the lack of chance for people to recover is also a contributing factor to that. Mm. Mm. OK, I'm getting a bit conscious of time. And we did want to pose one final question to all the panel, which was, uh, looking ahead to the, to the distant future, you know, what is, what's your ideal future for higher education based on our experience over the last couple of years? Where should we be in five years' time? So if you'd like to give us a, a, a quick vision of your ideal future, and again, I'll just nip around in alphabetical order. So David, your ideal future in higher education. It's going to be a more individual business i hope um we're going to respect and value what the students bring to their studies both their capabilities their knowledges their enthusiasms and crucially their questions so it's going to be much more individual than it has been i don't mean isolated um i think the flip side of individual is that students are going to be 
feel to be part of a wider academic community. Academic communities, plural, this community for this purpose, that community for that purpose, they're going to feel to be part of communities because goodness knows working together has never been more important and will become more and more important. So that individual dimension is, is going to be more significant. My big prayer plan intention above all is that we will pretty much have stopped talking about teaching. I'm, I'm writing a short book at the moment um, called Please Stop Teaching, which will give you a summary of my, the title gives you a summary of um, my views about teaching at the moment. We've got to shift back to teaching. So the next, when the next pandemic comes, we don't instantly leap to putting all our lectures online. I mean, for crying out loud, you know, it's heartbreaking. Focusing on learning is going to be more difficult, but goodness me, it's going to be exciting because we can have authentic conversations about learning and about doing. Um, we can have sensible conversations about the relationship between knowledge and capability, which is another thing I'm exploring like crazy. I think we... So in terms of the future, I pray we will stop overprivileging knowledge as we do at the moment and start appropriately privileging what we do to and with knowledge. So, yeah, five years for that rev revolution. That should just about work. Um, there's more if you want it, but I think that'll do for now. OK, uh, Sue, Sue Beckingham. I think for me, it's it's seen rather than it just being the the exception to the rule that actually our campus has has changed to having flexible classroom space, and that there is equal access to to laptops, whether the students bring those themselves or the access from lockers. Um, so you can have that online learning, interactive learning, using the devices, um, because there isn't equal access to. Um, technology you know some students will come come with their, their apple max and um fancy fancy laptops and others you know can't can't afford them so i hope we're in a situation where either technology is affordable and that is something that would be um something they could bring bring with them but we we provide them and obviously the wi-fi is up to up to scratch but also the the confidence that they can just jump onto a zoom meeting and and meet with their uh, um, either their module leader or their academic advisor, you know, to have a discussion, you know, and they could do that through chat, through um, the equivalent of a Zoom um, conversation or come in and see you. So it's adaptable. You know, certainly at my university, we have a lot of commuter students, you know, and depending on what um, their timetable's like, you know, it, it'll be good to have all these different alternatives for them. So that there is that choice for support as well as the, the approaches to learning and teaching. Thank you, Sue. Uh, Katrina. Yeah, I think I would like uh, a university or universities in five years time in the UK to be, so if we were doing this kind of thing, it wouldn't necessarily be in English. I think having uh, different languages, different cultures, different perspectives, so that kind of decolonial, decolonialization or decolonizing process will really shake up the, the kind of structural inequalities that exist in our university system in the UK and that will be It'd be challenged but good. Okay, thank you. And Mary. Uh, the one thing I don't want to hear again is uh, you're on mute, which I constantly find difficult and we're all using. Um, yeah, I mean, everything that's gone before, but I think, you know, a more flexible approach, a more accessible approach, a more international experience for students. Um, uh, an experience for students and staff that it's a, a certain um, partnership um, environment in which we're all working. So collaboration is key to everything that we're doing um, and that we take a much more program level approach. So, you know, um, that it's not just module leaders operating in silos on their own particular modules, which of course we've all seen that it, that we hold on to some of that. And I think if we, if we do that, I think we'll be playing a blind. Okay. So themes of personalization, themes of equality, themes of community. So I think those are, uh, are all uh, as a, in the same sense that David Kernahan gave us an agenda uh, yesterday. Uh, the students gave us an agenda this morning. I think we've all given ourselves an agenda uh, in this last session. So uh, all we have to do now is go and achieve it. And on that cheerful, positive note, 
I would like to bring this session to an end.